Hello everybody. I'd like to make a video about uh, what we did around our topic of learning and connection at yesterday's, yesterday evening's uh, potluck. And uh, it was all about the confession and forgiveness. So glad that those of you who were able to make it were there. Um, and if you were, you probably don't want to go through this presentation yet again. Uh, but for those of you who were not able to attend, maybe you're far away or uh, it didn't work out for you, I thought I'd uh, go ahead and deliver uh, what I did last night. Okay, so we're talking about the confession and forgiveness part of our worship service, uh, mostly about the why we do that at all, and then why we or how we go about this part of the worship service. It's often called confession and forgiveness. That's what we tend to call it in our bulletin. Uh, it's also uh, historically and currently called confession and absolution. Absolution, having your sins absolved, is uh, another word, way to say that your sins are forgiven. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're talking about in this presentation. Uh, you've probably seen this quote before by Martin Luther on the purpose of worship. And as you read this, uh, you might think to yourself, well, does confession and forgiveness belong in a worship service? Now, I would say that confession and absolution fits this to a T. So the purpose of worship is for our dear Lord to speak to us through his holy word and then our response to him in prayer and praise. Uh, so this uh, directional aspect of receiving God's word and responding to it is uh, very much, uh, I feel, uh, the confession and forgiveness is fitting that to a T. Uh, remember, um, there are different aspects of worship itself um, where we are receiving God's word and responding to it. So we're going to highlight this one. Now, when this is brought up, confession and forgiveness, uh, much of the language around it is really important. And uh, the language we see in Scripture, uh, th this is where this is coming out of. And a word that we should identify, especially when talking about confession and forgiveness, is the word repent. Now, when I read this in the Old Testament and the New Testament, my brain will often interpret and uh, see this almost as a thing that I must do, almost a command um, that says you, repent, get to it. This is a deed that I must perform and that I must perform with uh, honesty and uh, a level of being uh, contrite about it. This is not a scale, however. And I think the uh, Hebrew and the Greek uh, will reveal that this word that we translate as repent in English, you should know that that verb is a passive one. Now, we're talking grammar here. What are we doing? Well, it's kind of important that this passive word, this passive verb, means that it's not your action uh, that brings about a repentance. Rather, the passive nature of this means that it's done unto you. It's done to you, your repentance. Another way of saying repent is to be, to repent is to be repented and it always takes an outside word. And there's a couple of criteria that would move you who is bound in sin and cannot free yourself. Now, there's a couple of criteria that would actually move you to repent of your sins and your guilt. It's a word from the outside where you realize I'm guilty 
and I'm dead in sin. All fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's how Paul puts it in Romans. So, first criteria, maybe the best example of repentance that I uh, at least thought of for this presentation is uh, the Lord using the prophet Nathan uh, to tell David a story. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And this is David after he had sent Uriah to the front lines, Bathsheba's husband, uh, to the front lines for uh, him to be killed. And so he could have Bathsheba as his wife. So the Lord sends Nathan to David and he's, Nathan starts to tell a story. There were two men, a, a rich one and a poor one. The rich man had a large number of cattle and sheep. The poor man had one little ewe lamb that he loved greatly, almost like his own child. Um, it was like a daughter to him, the, the scripture says. And in this story, a traveler came by. He came to the rich man, and the rich man refrained from taking one of his own cattle or sheep to prepare a meal for the traveler, as was expected. And instead, he took the poor man's little ewe lamb and prepared it for the one who had come traveling. So David heard this story that the Lord had used Nathan to give him, and David said, he was, he was burning with anger. You would too, right? As surely as the Lord lives, David said, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And that's when the prophet Nathan turned to David and said, you're the man. You are that rich man who stole and gave um, what was not yours. And he said, you've sinned against the Lord. And then David was brought into this repentance and said, I have sinned against the Lord. He was beside himself, dead in his sin. And the best one of the best confessions in all of Scripture comes out in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He recognized his guilt. But the other part of this, so a word comes from the outside that says you're dead. You have died. Paul says it that way. But also you need to know what the solution might be to your death in sin, your bondage. And that's a place Someone who can take the burdens, the sins that you possess or the, those that have been placed on you. Now, David was preached another word that didn't kill, that made him alive. And this also is from God. And he found that forgiveness and he rejoiced in it. So when do you repent? When you've been brought low by an external word. And then you know also that you can be lifted up. There's a resurrection word out there. So that's what brings you to repentance. Now, this is not totally attractive, is it? It's <laughs> Admitting our own guilt is not so easy. <clears throat> so that way we, we phrase repentance uh, will alter our view. Is this whole confession and forgiveness part of the worship a sacrifice that we muster up? Does it depend on me and how contrite I am if I'm doing this the right way? Does it depend on me earning future glory? Does it depend on me being alive after being brought dead? Now, all of these things, that's pretty arresting. It is frightening. If everything is on you and the quality and the quantity of your sacrifice, you are in trouble. But thankfully, 
that confession and forgiveness is a gift of God. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on God having the gift to give. He does. That's the truth. And God delivering it to you. So how will we know that God has this gift and that he delivers it to you? Well, let's get after that. Uh, before we get on to how we do this in our worship service, uh, you should know that the title of this is telling. Uh, throughout the centuries of worship in the Christian church, people have tried to play dodgeball with the accusation that you're a sinner. You think, oh, that's somebody else. I'm not the sinner, right? Surely we've moved on from this. The Cranberry Hymnal, a Lutheran hymnal, will even change this from confession and absolution or confession and forgiveness into a remembrance of baptism. We've got a lot of ways that we try to um, dodge this accusation and pretend, really, uh, the untruth that we are not guilty of putting Jesus on his cross and killing him. So we're actually going to name it what it truly is. We're naming sin when we confess them. And then it is truly being forgiven in the name of Christ. So we're not going to dodge this. Uh, because we believe that this is the difference between life and death, between cross and resurrection. All right, so how shall we do this? Hmm, all right, how often should we do the confession and forgiveness? I'd say every time. <laughs> I mean... There's still sins on us and not Christ when the forgiveness word isn't used. So I think we should use it often. Uh, there was a, once the, the old church I was a lay person in, um, and we would skip it once in a while. And I actually went up to our pastor and said, hey, I've been walking around in bondage to sin all week, pastor and, uh, I can't free myself. I need a word. Um, could we do the confession and forgiveness every time? Thankfully, he was very receptive to that, and we did. So, yeah, we tend to do this every time we gather to worship. Uh, next question is, who who needs this? Well, is anyone not guilty? No. Scripture reveals that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. Everyone who lives in this fallen world is guilty by their own sin. Uh, there are sins placed on you. Just living and being out and about in this world. And uh, we can't not sin, <laughs> in fact. So... I'd say everyone needs to hear this word. Now, what words are we going to hear? The words themselves can change slightly, but the gift being given never does. It's the gospel. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, you are forgiven of all your sins. Now, I could say that different, differently. Jesus Christ forgives you your sins. Uh, so there's a number of ways to say it, but the delivery of the gift of Christ himself in his word of forgiveness needs to be proclaimed and heard for this to happen. And that, in short, is how we say that's the gospel in a nutshell, the forgiveness of sins by God to you. And the to you is important. We don't say uh, there are some sins out there that will be forgiven uh, we don't say, uh, when a group of people, uh, gets this thing right, then they will be absolved. We don't say there's some sins out there that are going to be forgiven or that are forgiven because that leaves you wondering, well, what about mine? Am I forgiven? So the direct address needs to happen. This is for you. 
so uh, hopefully that comes out. Public confession or private? Yeah, <laughs> God will use both ways in consolation between baptized believers among you. This could happen privately in my pastor's office. It could be happening out in a game, just in a regular conversation. God will forgive sins in many different ways. But during our service, we say it's a corporate thing. It's public. We're all confessing our sins together. We're making a general confession. We might even be coming up with particular sins that are weighing down on us. But then they're going to be absolved, forgiven one at a time, but too many people that are hearing that word in the worship service together. So we confess together. We are forgiven uh, one by one. Uh, and uh, this can happen public or private. Uh, is this relevant? Have we moved past this as an advanced society? No. It's relevant. It's the most relevant thing, in fact. Uh, in the name of relevance, the church is trying to get past it and, again, play dodgeball uh, with the true claim that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. But that's a lie. <laughs> that it's a lie if we avoid it. Uh, so we say this is like the most relevant thing, God's word that changes us, God's word that kills us and makes us alive. I'd say resurrection for a dead man is very relevant. Okay. So uh, a potential problem. We're a bunch of sinners around here in our church at St. Paul Lutheran. We're all in bondage. Now, how is this going to work? Who can actually do this? How can the absolute become the absolute absolver to us? Can any of us actually forgive? Well, that's where we take scripture's word for it. We don't pull this out of thin air. Scripture, Jesus, says, I forgive you. Now, you get out there. Here's the keys. I'm giving them to you. You have my word. It's by my authority. It's by my command. It's by God's promise. Now you go forgive the sins of others in my name and by my authority. That's what Jesus says many times in many places in the Bible. These are a handful of my favorite Office of the Keys issuing uh, moments in Scripture. And this is, as the Scripture uh, reveals, uh, these passages reveal, this word needs to get out. The word has been getting out, and we continue to proclaim this living word right here, right now, today, and we must into the future. Again, God's people need this word. So um, these are some of my favorite places where we find out who has the keys. It turns out that you and me Baptized believers are part of the royal priesthood that can proclaim the promise of Christ. Wow. That might seem shocking. It is. It is shocking that he would use sinners to forgive the sins of others. But we're doing this in the name of Christ and by his authority. So when God decides to use his word to forgive sinners, even though it's coming through a, the mouth of a sinner, it's God's word doing it. God's word does the work. So, uh, Luther says this about the office of the keys. For Christ has given to every one of his believers the power to absolve even open sins. Seek pardon and comfort, that is, in the word of Christ, by the mouth of his neighbor. So, wow, you can do this, I can do this. Uh, now we're going to go through an example. It's kind of like going through film as a coach in sports. 
We're going to look at time, space, and direction, aspects of the part of the service itself um, to see what's going on and why we might do the way this the way we are doing. Um, at first, what we do is I get as close to you as possible. I might even go down the steps or stay right there at the top of the steps where you can see me. And I'm going to issue you a word as your pastor. I'm going to say, God be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Acknowledging that we need God here. And then you respond, actually, to me, your pastor, and you will say something like, and also with you. Uh, in the last century, the words there... Um, are wonderful too. They, you might have said, and with thy spirit. We know that our souls need the presence of God uh, in this place right here and now. And I'm giving that to you, and you're giving that right back to me. So I am facing you at this point. I am close to you. And I'm uh, speaking in your direction, and you're speaking in mine. The next move, well, before the next move, now what kind of posture are you in? As the congregation, we tend to stand. Uh, you may have been at churches, uh, including this one before, where you might kneel at this point. Whether you are standing or kneeling, we like to do one of those things, and we're currently standing. We're trying to show reverence to God. We're going to give God his due. We are kneeling or standing in um, preparation for what God is about to do. We are getting in a position to say, you do your thing, God. So we'll stand at this point for this part of the service. But it's not just our posture. We're not going to stop and just be in a posture. We're actually going to send words. So the next words that are typical, uh, this is an example, are actually a prayer to God. Father of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people. I, as your pastor, uh, am sending this prayer. And with your amen, you're putting your stamp on this too. You're saying, hey, <clears throat> what pastor just said, that's true, God. This is the prayer we're sending you. We're about to confess our sins with the full expectation that you will hold to your promise to forgive us. We are standing here before you. In the words that he said, yeah, that goes for what we want to happen. That's what your amen is saying, let it be so. Now, I'm still standing in that position that you see on the screen. And at this point, I'm going to turn around as one of you. And on behalf of everyone there, we're all in the same boat together. Uh, but we've um, practiced in our confession and forgiveness a moment of silence uh, where reflection happens, self-examination happens, uh, where we can bring particular sins uh, before God. Now, what are we doing during that time? Uh, as I said last night, a lot of you parents are probably sending a prayer to God for your child to remain quiet, and to not disturb the silence. Our thoughts can go in a lot of directions. Um, and there's different things, like how long should this silence be? I've never taken a stopwatch to what we do around here. My guess is about 15 seconds. Uh, but the time, like some people use that time to reflect and um, they want to list uh, almost and show the honesty of where they are before God. Um, or to name specific sins, maybe, of themselves before God in that time. That's a good use of that time, and that's why we spend it. Now, there are other thoughts, too, and my professor had one, 
that the longer you stay in the self-reflection and self-examination, the further spiraling into unbelief, disbelief that you might fall into, and you don't want to fall so down into the hole that you can't hear the word of promise that's going to come out next. So he said, get rid of it. Um, I think both way, and he would acknowledge this too, both ways can happen. Uh, we tend to keep that short, uh, silent reflection and examination. And notice, yeah, I'm facing that direction. But then we're going to actually make a general confession to God. And before we go there, like what sins should you name during that personal or even private private time of confession? Uh, don't torture yourself with imaginary sins, Luther says. If you can't think of any sins to confess, which if you go through the Ten Commandments or your dealings with people during the week, uh, Luther says, which would hardly ever happen, you not having any sins to confess, uh, we need not name any in particular, don't worry, but receive absolution because you've, you will make a general confession to God. So that's our next move. We address God and we make a confession. We do this together. We try to stick with one another. That can be a tricky thing for the whole congregation to speak these words in unison or pretty close to it, but we try our best to do this. And we use words uh, such as these, saying that we are trapped, that we are in bondage, that we are sinful. And we also pray for God to keep his promise. Bring us back. Make us alive. Give us life. Give us Christ and his word of forgiveness. So we say these things together. That is the confession. And we're actually facing the altar. Uh, we know that God is present at this point. And we're facing our God when we make our confession. And then something changes. Finally, I actually turn around. And in the moment that I turn around, the reason that I would do this is because it's not my authority and it's not my word that I that is going to forgive any single sin that you've committed. I can't do that. But when I turn around, that's to show everyone that I am no longer speaking as me. I'm speaking on behalf of God. And by his command and promise in scripture, we will use the words that actually absolve sins. And we want to have this be a direct address. And these are bolded. And in those that bolded time that you can see here where the direct address is happening, happening I forgive you the entirety of all your sins by Christ's authority. I will make the sign of the cross to again turn to you, get to you, and make sure that you can hear me say the word of God that your sins are forgiven. And what do you say? Amen. You have it your way. Let it be so. This is happening. Thanks be to God. So this is the absolution, the absolute absolution. And uh, we have and can give wonderful thanks to God at this time as well. So that's what's happening during that little part. Uh, big things are happening in that little part of the service. And we hope to forgive sins in the name of Christ, also in a sermon in the Lord's Supper uh, during our worship. But this was the Confession and Forgiveness. Thanks for checking this out.